Well, if you look on the screen today, I want you to know that we're going to be talking about two things this morning. As Paul talks about two things in the opening salvo here of this epistle to the church at Colossae. Last Sunday night, we introduced this four-chapter book, 95 verses, 72, that have reference directly to Jesus Christ by saying in verses 5 through 8, how do we reflect Jesus in our lives? And you know, that really is a concern for all of us in the room, that, that everybody in the room reflect Jesus in their lives. As we move past that section, we go to verses 9 through 14. So if you have your Bibles, let's follow along and, and read this together. I'll read out loud and you follow along silently. For this reason, as a result of what we just talked about last Sunday night, for this reason, how do we reflect Christ in our lives? For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with all the knowledge of his will and wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our sins. You know, one thing that you can learn about Paul is that Paul was a tremendous man of prayer. Now, as we think about our lives and how we fit these messages into our lives, we have to ask ourselves the question, do I pray? Do I pray not just when I'm sick, not just when I'm sad, not just when I'm grieving, not just when I'm hurting, not just when I have troubles, but do I also have a prayer of thanksgiving in my life? I want you to note five things here very quickly that, that Paul was asking these Colossian brethren for God to do for them. And here are the five things, and you can just see them in a sequence here in verses 9 and 10. Number one, that they might be filled with the knowledge of His will. Now, why is that important? Because our wills often get in the way. I don't know if we sing it here, but some of the other places I've been in my travels, there's a song that I remember called, Letting Go of My Stubborn Will. At last, my stubborn will has yielded. You know, as we walk through these doors today, we, we constantly dealing with our will, our want, our desire, instead of His. And so Paul was praying for these folks that they might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now that word knowledge is going to be important in the next few weeks and a couple of months because that word knowledge there means gnosis. And what's going to happen in the church of Colossae is there's going to come somebody into this church and they're going to give some false knowledge about Jesus. And we're going to need to know what that is. And, and Paul says, you need to know what that is. And here's, here's what it is in a nutshell, and we'll be talking more about it. It was called Gnosticism with a G in front of it. Gnosticism, and they were a group of people called the Gnostics. Now, why is this so important? It's very important just because of what Chris called our attention to about Jesus on the cross. That Jesus was in the flesh. Gnosticism says this, anything in the flesh is evil, ungodly. And so that would strike at the heart of Jesus coming in the flesh. And so Gnosticism says nothing good can come from the flesh. But Jesus, we see in John 1, 14, came in the flesh in a human form. So Gnosticism is false teaching. And so we're going to learn that throughout the epistle of Colossians. The second thing he talks about is in verse 10. He says, I want you to live a life worthy of the Lord. Not only in the book of Colossians, but in the book of Ephesians repeatedly, especially chapters 4, 5, and 6, he talked about walking worthy of the Lord. Paul said, I, I, I want you to walk worthy of the Lord. And, and he said that in a continuing basis. And think about how hard that is. 
This morning, while we're all assembled here in this room, it's easy, it's simple, it's a piece of cake to walk worthy of the Lord because we're among people who love us and care about us and are not going to harm us and want the best for us. But I'm telling you, once we exit this room, E-V-I-L, we meet the onslaught of the evil one and the enemy that's out there. And it's going to be difficult to walk worthy of the Lord when you get to where you work tomorrow and somebody says, what did you do yesterday? Well, I went to church. <laughs> you, you got up and you went to church and you got children ready in the process. How hard was that? Huh? And that's what you're going to get. And you're going to have to walk worthy in front of those folks. Number three, he talks about bearing fruit in every good work. I want to ask you this question. We talked about it at the end of our message last Sunday night, the nine fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Are you bearing fruit as you day by day live your life for the Lord? Are you producing love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, temperance, faithfulness, gentleness, meekness? Against such there is no limit. There is no law. There is no amount of good that we can accomplish as we try to bear fruit in every good work. The fourth thing he talks about was growing in the knowledge of God. How are you going to be able to combat Gnosticism? Because of the knowledge that you have in the Lord. How are you going to be able to say to the Gnostics, no, it's not true what you're teaching, because you have the knowledge of the Lord. And then number five, he says, I want you to be strengthened. Strengthened with all power. These are just five quick things that he, that he touches base on in the first three verses of our text. The second thing he talks about is gratitude. You know, it's easy around uh, the third or fourth Thursday in November to think about gratitude, where we stop as a nation and as a country, and where we have that day where we bring our families together and we crucify old Turk. <laughs> We get, we get the Turk already, and we get all the trimmings and all that good stuff that goes with it. And some people, some people don't like turkey, so you have ham or, or you have chicken. Let me, let me all caution you about chicken. If you're not careful, chicken will foul you up. Just for your own knowledge there, I want you to know that. But, but, but here he says, express gratitude because God is the source of every blessing. And we need to remember that. Think about this. In these three verses, James 1.17, I love this. Every good and every perfect gift is from above. What did you say, James? I said that every good and every perfect gift comes down from above as we look to the Father of lights, with whom, with God, there is no variation. Neither is any shadow of turning. And here's what that means, that God is a constant 24-7. We go through the seasons. We go through the periods of time. We talked just a little bit in class about SAD. An acronym for this time of year, a seasonal adjustment disorder that some folks are plagued by when they don't see the sun. And it's understandable if you don't get light that you have SAD in your life and you, we all need the light in our life. And so gratitude is simply saying that it comes down from a God who 24-7 is constantly bearing gifts to us. I want to show you something out of the Psalms this morning. It's chapter 107. And I want to read the first nine verses about gratitude. Psalm 107, verses 1 through 9. So follow along in your Bibles or make a mental note of this. I think this will be a great encouragement to you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. Watch this. And he delivered them out of their distress. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Watch 9. For he, God, satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. You know what that psalm is all about? Gratitude. 
thankfulness. There's another verse on the screen as you see. It's 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3. To this church, Paul writes, We thank God always for you because your faith grows exceedingly and you have great love toward each other. You know what gratitude is? Gratitude is not complaining about my situation. What about the man today who complains about his feet? They're hurting. They're aching. And then he goes to the hospital. And he finds the man who had to have his feet amputated. What about the person who complains that their eyes are bothering them and they have a, they have a headache? And then they find a man with a cane and a dog by his side. And this is the way he navigates through life because he's blind. What about the person who says that they have a tremendous earache and their ear is just bothering them to the nth degree? And they see somebody standing in front of another person and they're doing sign language in front of them so that they can communicate because they cannot hear at all. They're deaf. You see, gratitude is understanding that if things are as well with us as they are, that we need to be thankful. Can I get an amen? amen? That we can sit and we can listen to a lesson from God's Word as He directs to us two things that we need to have a part of our chemistry and our makeup. That that we are people of prayer, not just when we're in distress, but 24-7. And that we are people that understand that when blessings come our way, as they have even today, we say thank you to the Lord over and over and over. In these few verses, and I'm going to hold 13 and 14 for my conclusion, but in these few verses, I want you to see four things that I hope you'll take home with you today. Number one, that God would continually use you. The very first time that I went to the Eastern Caribbean, I went with an octogenarian. I went with a guy, and I looked over there at this guy, and I said, man, this guy, this guy is 80 years old. What is he doing going where the heat will pound you and pound you and pound you? I mean, it will. From the time you get up to the time you go to bed, it's just intense heat. And you're out in the elements. You go to a building that if they have a building, it's not air-conditioned. Or if it's a tent, you're out in the elements. It's hot. And here was an 80-year-old man. He got up and gave one of our devotional talks one day. And I never will forget the words of Charlie Arnett. That was his name. Charlie said, I want to tell everybody here today, and it was one of the biggest groups we'd ever had for a campaign. He said, you're looking at a man who's 80 years old. And he said, I made the decision that, I'd rather, that I would rather wear out than rust out. You know what Charlie was saying in that little brief sentence or two? I want God to continue to use me. Would you pray that prayer today in your own life? That God can use you where you go to school to be a difference in the life of somebody in that school who has hopelessness, who's turning to drugs and alcohol, and sex for fulfillment? Would you be a beacon at school that God can use you that way? Where you work, would you be a beacon in your workplace where, where somebody says, well, there, there's nothing more to life than just work, work, work. That's all I want to do in my life is just work. And to help them see that God can use them in a different capacity, in a different realm. I want you to think about praying for continued usefulness. Number two. Will you pray for increased knowledge? There is so much I don't know. And I pause there to give you a chance to say amen. Thank you for not doing that. You know, when, when I go to a seminar or a workshop or a lectureship and I, I sit and I listen to all of these speakers, I'm thinking, boy, I, know, I don't know a lot. And I need to increase my knowledge. 
Let me give you Richard Eubank's favorite scripture. It's Romans 10, 17. That's it, isn't it, Richard? So then faith comes by hearing, hearing through and by the word of God. How am I going to increase my faith? It's when I dig into the book, when I look into what God has to say. And that's what we're doing with the book of Colossians in January and February. Increase our knowledge so if the Gnostics come into this building, we'll be able to tell them, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We don't believe Gnosticism is true. Number three, will you live a worthy life? Let me, let me give you one word here. You ready for this? Got your seatbelt on? Purpose. You know why there's a lot of depression? That's not chemical, but a lot of depression and sadness and sorrow in our culture. People have lost their purpose. They don't have any reason to go on. When you realize that you have a purpose, even in this room, you can live a worthy life. And number four, will you, with me, beginning today, be more thankful? I'm thankful that I have, to my knowledge, a good physical heart, that my kidneys are working, that my lungs are producing the air I need to breathe and to do this message, that I have legs, that I have all of my fingers and all of my toes. I'm just thankful in a physical way for the way God has blessed my life. But I'm also thankful spiritually. I'm thankful for this body of believers that I can stand in front of and I can look out and say, man, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad this is your church home. I'm glad this is a place where you can camp out and, and just, just be thankful. I want to close in verses 13 and 14 and I've, I've decided not to put these on the screen. Because I just want to talk for a few minutes from the heart with you about these last two verses of our text. And so I want you to go back and look with me at Colossians 1, verses 13 and 14. I think there's something here for us that is easy to be missed. And so I want to focus in on these verses by way of conclusion this morning. Let me read it again. He, he, God, Jesus, he, Jesus, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom, Jesus, God, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Look again with me at verse 13. You and I, for the most part in this room, we realize that we've been delivered. You know what that means? We have been rescued. Did you see the story this week of the little girl in Minnesota who had been missing for 87 days? She got loose from her monster and she ran up to a lady who was walking her dog. She immediately knew who that little girl was. And they went to the first house they could find, and they pounded on the door. Let us in, let us in. We have found she's been rescued. She's been delivered from the evil one. That's us. That's you and that's me. We've been delivered. We've been rescued. And we have been conveyed or, or translated or transferred into the kingdom of the Son of His love. The very kingdom that Jesus shed his blood for. You and I can be members of the kingdom of God, of the kingdom of Jesus, of the church of Christ. We can be members of that. That's why we need to be thankful and grateful and prayerful that you and I have been conveyed into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Incidentally, in verse 14, in whom we have redemption. In other words... He purchased us. I mentioned this in class. We were talking about the word impute, I-M-P-U-T-E, which carries with it the idea of a debt that's being canceled. And I gave the illustration that I have a, Tina and I, we have a mortgage on our house. We owe. We still owe. And wouldn't it be amazing if somebody walked up to me today and say, we want to impute you from your mortgage. 
You know what that would mean to me? You want to cancel my debt. You want to strike a line through my mortgage. You'd see one happy guy because I've been released. My, my, my debt's been purchased. See, that's Colossians 1.14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Is there any greater debt that can be paid on our behalf than the fact that Jesus went to the cross for us and paid our debt? I am so thankful. And Brian and I, we didn't even work this out together. But the song that we're going to sing, didn't it? Jesus paid a debt. And you must have ESPN 1 or 2. We got that together. You, know, you got ESPN 3. Well, you're good. You're good. They didn't even know they had it. He paid a debt. He didn't know. But he paid it for us. Have you allowed God to cancel the debt on your behalf?